streaming or
this could come to a screeching halt. So we feel the sense of urgency, but we are making improvements. Um, it was mentioned a couple times this morning um, that the Senate passed the Future Act. The Senate passed the Future Act um, with language permitting data sharing between uh, IRS and the Department of Education for FAFSA filers. We talked about this morning. The House of Representatives then passed the Senate's version with some amendments, and then last night, the Senate unanimously accepted those changes. As Josh, Josh mentioned, the bill is headed to the President's desk, and President Trump has indicated that he will sign it. So what does that mean? We talked about it a little bit this morning. Uh, this will really protect the integrity of the, the data. Uh, it will allow our state student aid programs that rely on this kind of information to determine eligibility without some of the burdensome income verification that was there in the past. Um, it'll make it easier for students to access our very generous need-based programs here in Indiana, uh, including the Pell Grant, the Federal Pell Grant, and the Frank O'Bannon Grant. And it'll allow us to apply for more affordable monthly payments on federal student loans, allow students to. It also, as we talked about, will eliminate many of the questions on FAFSA, and I think I, think I heard 22 questions from the current complicated form. This is certainly a positive development, especially in light of uh, the, there was a question whether we would get anything accomplished in this area. Just finally, as we conclude the year, uh, internally at the Commission, we're in the process of doing our performance reviews. This really is an opportunity to us to provide support and professional development for our staff so that they can be more successful in their roles, and, uh, and also to thank them for great service. So thank you to each and every member of the CHE staff. Um, employers, higher education institutions, and communities 
uh, to, to collaborate to a greater extent. And then finally, kind of getting at the heart of reaching higher in the state of change. You know, the economy is changing, our learner population is changing, technology is changing, so how can our institutions for higher education innovate with an eye for the future to meet the needs that we haven't even yet identified? And that's what Future, future Focus is all about. We divided the plan into three sections, uh, which we've talked about at length before, completion, equity, and talent. Um, I want to draw your attention to the equity definition in particular because we spent a lot of time talking about this. Um, it says, educational equity means that life circumstances or obstacles should not dictate opportunity to succeed. And I think um, we really nailed it with that definition and we listened to your input. We tried to come up with a, a definition that was clear uh, for not just members of our commission, but people from around the state who are steeped in um, higher education terms and terminology to help them understand what we're talking about. And then we identified five key action areas. And we didn't pull these out of thin air. Um, we talked about all of these in, in our retreat. Um, so just kind of to go through what each of these mean. Um, pathways and transitions. This is all about ensuring the right fit for every learner. And you'll notice that the to-do items in pathways and transitions focus a lot on high school and also the handoffs between high school and post-secondary institutions. Affordability is a, an action area that we've had in previous plans as well. Uh, it's about finding ways to reduce the cost of college and reduce student loan debt, understanding that completion is key to the full affordability picture. Community engagement, bringing communities into higher ed and getting higher ed out into the communities. And doing so will do wonders to help us grow a culture that values education and make different regions of the state, particularly our rural communities, healthier and more vibrant. Um, the educator pipeline, so we resurrected this action area from the first strategic plan. And we heard some feedback early on that it stood out among the other action areas, but we thought it was important to include because we know that teachers, counselors, and school leaders are so critical to increasing educational attainment, preparing students for college, preparing talent that supports our economy. And higher ed can influence and lead improvements in our state when it comes to those areas, uh, particularly uplifting the profession in general. And finally, quality. Uh, we made quality its own action area because we heard from members of this commission that quality must be emphasized in all we do. And our learners won't realize the true benefits of higher education. We won't be able to meet employer needs, and we can't really achieve equity if we don't also ensure quality. So it's critical to all three sections of our plan. So building from those three sections and um, the five action areas that we identified, we put together our blueprint for higher education. We're particularly proud of the design of this one. We think it's really cool. Uh, and it's difficult to see in the stapled version that you have in front of you, but in the final um, published version, the vision is that in each of the five action areas, you have a list of to-do items on one side, and then to help define and supplement those to-do items, you have data, infographics, definitions that explain the to-do items that we're calling for. Again, difficult to read on the big screen, but you should have this in front of you as well. We end um, the, the plan with some key metrics that we talked about at length this morning um, in three key areas. One, obviously, is progress for the 60% goal. Two, is career relevance and preparation. And three, is economic impact. To go through these in a little more detail, um, the first one, we discussed this metric at length in the last meeting. Um, now it's, it's one of three, but we know it's an important one. So we'll measure this first fire overall attainment rate. Then we'll supplement that with our latest completion numbers to show our progress in the areas that contribute to that educational attainment rate. So college going rate, on time and extended time completion, and completion by adults with some college or no college or diploma at all. For context in this metric, we added a graphic on the right to show people what currently counts for Indiana's overall educational attainment rate and what we might consider including in that measurement that is currently left out. We discussed this at length in the October meeting and we have plans to work with our partners at Lumina directly to discuss potential sol solutions and determine what's possible in terms of expanding our educational attainment measurement. For our second metric, uh, career relevance and preparation, uh, this 
will be measured by progress toward 100% of post-secondary programs requiring an internship, work-based research, or other student engagement experience that has career relevance. Some version of this was included in both reaching higher, achieving more, and reaching higher, delivering value as a to-do item. However, we never took steps to implement or track progress in this area. We see this as both a talent focus metric and a quality metric. The final key metric that we've included in this plan is economic impact. So it's measuring progress for Indiana becoming a leading Midwest state for median household income with two sub goals, one short term, one long term, short term to help us be above average of our peer states and by 2030 to be among the top states for median household income. Obviously, we're going to, to look at this and decide what the right metric is moving forward, uh, but I think we agreed to move forward with some sort of income metric and educational attainment metric. So some other items of note um, that we haven't been through, but we thought were important to call out to the commission because they directly affect our work and, and our to-do items in the next year and ahead. So we included a section based on feedback that clearly out, outlines our role as a commission and includes some accountability metrics. So one obviously is advocacy, so continuing to advocate for the value of higher education um, and, and the things that, um, that we know lead to greater student success, like dual credit, that kind of thing. Uh, but there's also, we call for annual internal implementation plans and supporting communications and outreach toolkits every year. So we'll be identifying the to-do items from the plan that we'll be trying to implement each year of this, bringing that to you to review. And then once we get that, we'll be building um, outreach materials to help um, not just our institutions, but our K-12 partners and other stakeholders help us spread the word. And then there are two to-do items that are specifically called out in the mission differentiation section of Reaching Higher in the State of Change. One calls for the commission to evaluate and offer recommendations to alter and or solidify the institutional missions. And the second is to partner with higher education institutions to project enrollment and completion targets. So while these pieces aren't included in the blueprint, you can expect to be hearing from us about both of these items in the future. So if you all decide to uh, vote for this plan, here's what will happen next. So, uh, we'll go back and we'll make final edits and prepare the plan for print um, in January. And then Commissioner Lovers will officially unveil the new plan as part of her remarks in the 2020 State of Higher Education Address on Tuesday, February 11th in the State House. I hope you all can be there. And then at an upcoming commission meeting in 2020, we will be presenting to you, as mentioned, our um, 2020 internal operations plan, our communication and outreach toolkits, and at some point a template for the annual report card. So we'll be holding ourselves accountable to it. So with that, uh, staff recommends moving on. And just to, if you could pop back up that last, uh, I think the last slide. Uh, yeah, so the commission staff will make final edits and prepare the plan for print in January, consistent with our discussion this morning. Uh, is there, Discussion? Questions? Move Second. Do you have any comments? Yes. Um, Please. I, I want to congratulate the staff for uh, well, the work done here. I, I think it, for the commission and over a lot of years, the consistency and the focus has really been important. Uh, the ability to bring change to Indiana, the Indiana's <laughs> educational environment, it, it's required a consistency on the part of the commission. And the Yes, sir. Yes. yes, sir. I concur, Chris. Congratulations to staff. I would just ask that we take to heart the comments, particularly that Chris made this morning in the working session. I think that the work is just too great not to be better. I just think it's some touching up refining to really bring out the cogent points that are there. But it's much great work. And then I would just ask 
there was a section where our section where Parisa could be included. I noted a quote that seemed conspicuous by absence that there is no leading comment from you in this document. Well, there's quite a few. There are some uh, quotes from her. No, that's what I said. There's a quote, but I know that there's a, a statement from our chair, but not from our commission. <laughs> She's always the last thing to speak out. So. I'd like to echo the sentiments. It's really, really fine work. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the key, um, the, the name uh, of uh, the state of change, I, I think that is really uh, timely. Because uh, I was talking to somebody recently, went to an innovation uh, uh, gathering. And they said, if you, if you think there's a lot of change happening now, just wait. And so education uh, has, is doing that, but um, um, it really does define, I think, the era that we're in. So I think uh, identifying that was, was, was uh, a really uh, insightful uh, uh, thing. Uh, finally, I, and kind of consistent with, with the statements that were made this morning, if you look on, on page 14 where we have the completion equity challenge, um, we, we might, I would suggest that we consider as we make some tweaks to say uh, learners need under talent, learners need the skills and competencies to be successful on the job and in the community, I would say, because we, we talk about how important education is to impact entire communities and a big part of education is learning in the community too. So you might want to consider adding that phrase as we as we make change. Good suggestion. I, Dennis, I do like your suggestion. We do need a quote from the commissioner to talk about. Um, any other comments before we take a vote? Uh, everyone in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, say aye. It passed unanimously. Congratulations. Thank you very much. We're now moving to the public square, and we're honored to have Tammy Marisotis, the president of the CEO of Lumina Foundation, with us, and Scott Jenkins, C Mike. Uh, the strategy director, I always think of him as the state ahead of all of our state activities. State policy. Yeah, he's got yeah. State policy, right. So, uh, uh, there's no formal introduction, but I wanted, everyone's read the bio, but I, I, I wanted to point out, Jamie's been the uh, president of Lumina, I'm fortunate to serve on the board of Lumina for the last six or seven years. And Jamie's been the president for what, 10 or 12 years? Yeah, at the end of my 11th year. 11th year. And what's remarkable is, and uh, under Jamie's watch, prior to my participation, the, the Lumina came up with the idea that our country needs to have a goal of 60% of our uh, uh, population, working age population have a post-secondary degree in order to, one, provide opportunity for the 60, for our, our citizens, and uh, also to, to uh, supply the, the people necessary for our employers of the future. And what's remarkable is that this one idea has really grabbed the country. We now have how many states, 43 states? 43 states. 43 states have signed on to that uh, California is probably an exception. <laughs> is California an exception? Yes, it is. <laughs> but 43 out of 50 states uh, have signed on to, to achieve that goal. I think Tennessee slightly modified it, it made it 55%. Uh, and the good news is these states are really focused on that, and Lumina is spending an enormous amount of time uh, assisting them in uh, achieving that goal. And so, Scott focuses on working with the states, and uh, Jamie and Scott, we're delighted to have you here. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Lovers, and uh, 
It's a delight to be back in front of the commission. I've been here several times over the years, uh, even back before your time, Chair and Chris. I've, I've, so I've been here for, for, for a while, and uh, really thrilled to be to be back and uh, to make this a home game. Um, it's really nice, and Scott and I are on the road a lot. It's nice to be back back here. And, and uh, although, as we've learned from the Colts, sometimes a home game doesn't mean that you're going to do very well. So uh, we'll see. That's up to you to judge how, how, how we do today. Um, you know, so I've, I've um, had a really good conversation with Teresa and the team, and we decided that we'd talk a little bit from some prepared remarks, and then from that, engage in some dialogue, uh, and hopefully uh, have some good discussion and conversation, get your feedback and some of the comments that, that we're wait, making. And, you know, I wanted to begin by saying that, you know, Teresa and I really have the privilege of leading these uh, organizations that are strong partners. With, with really a, a shared mission to help more of our citizens get post-secondary education and succeed in our changing world. Uh, we not only share a, a common board member in Al Hubbard, which we're very proud to, to, uh, to share, but we share an awful lot. And I think um, today our common mission has never been more urgent. And I want to underscore a couple of things that Stephanie mentioned in her presentation about the strategic plan, which we're very impressed with and very pleased to see you uh, moving ahead. One is that quote uh, from uh, your chairman uh, in the, the letter from the chair, and the specific line that says, higher education remains a powerful force to address income inequality, close equity gaps, provide personal prosperity, drive economic growth, and promote civic engagement in our American society. I mean, I, I think that's it. I think that uh, pretty much lays out the stakes of, of what we're facing here. A belief in the importance of higher education has been part of the DNA of Indiana and our nation from, from the start. Revitalizing higher ed to meet the nation's uh, needs of today's students, of employers and residents is critical if we're really going to make the 21st century another American century. So I want to start by congratulating you on your work, and uh, by that I don't just mean this uh, excellent plan, but also your body of work going back, uh, you know, really two decades and how that's led to real progress for Hoosier. Um, you know, we spent some time looking back on those three strategic plans that uh, Stephanie was, was referring to, and each of them, I think, was well targeted to the needs of the time. You've long recognized the importance of post-secondary attainment as a fundamental measure of success, creating uh, the 60% goal in uh, 2012 was a very important milestone in, in our view. Um, and as Al just pointed out, since we started this work at Lumina going back to 2008 of encouraging states to set these goals, 42 states have now joined Indiana in setting these important goals. And then you know, looking at your 2016 plan where you emphasize the importance of value, you know, we think that's become very uh, important and urgent as tuition rates and debt have surged along with this gap between skills acquired through higher education and those that are actually required when it comes to today's jobs and the work that people are doing today. Um, you know, I think a good measure of the wisdom of these plans is the results. In 2008, only one-third of Hoosiers had a quality post-secondary credential of 33.4%. We know these data. But over the past decade, that number has risen by 10 percentage points overall, which represents both an increase in degrees and the recognition of high-quality post-secondary certificates. This increase is notable because it represents thousands of Hoosiers receiving high-quality post-secondary credentials that otherwise would not have, have received them. So this good work has propelled nearly half the residents of our state into a dynamic economy with the skills to compete. So that's the good news. Uh, there is some bad news, and the bad news is that where Indiana stands today at 43.4%, is about five percentage points, actually five percentage points exactly behind the national average, which we just updated uh, in the last month to 48.4% as of 2018. So in 53 of Indiana's 92 counties, that number is under 30%. As with the nation as a whole, we have a lot of work to do quickly to reach 60%. So this is one of the reasons why I'm impressed with your blueprint that you've just, uh, you've just talked about, and it's focus on the future and on completion, equity, and talent. These themes, I think, are spot on for Indiana, for our fast-paced, high-tech work environment, and for this moment, for this time in our history. 
And uh, again, I want to underscore, the second thing I wanted to underscore about what Stephanie said is, I think these shifts that she pointed out between the former plans and this are noteworthy, that shift from student-centered to learner-centered, which I think acknowledges the shift from traditional college students of the past to the learners we need to serve today. That shift in terms of, of it being future focused, which acknowledges uh, you know, what is really this sort of inexorable pace of change, which will require partnering as we meet future needs and create opportunities. And, and the shift that we noticed at Lumina about this shift from talking about workforce to talking about talent, which recognizes that people will need to continuously upgrade their skills to compete in our fluid economy. Now, the reason why this shift in the language is so profound is because I believe that the future of human work will be positive for people in our economy if we actually help them prepare for it. The worlds of learning and work are, are merging really in very powerful ways. Adults will need to be learner workers, ratcheting back and forth over the course of their lifetimes. You know, I say often that gone are the times, the linear times, when you could plan out your, your life very neatly saying, you know, first I'll learn, then I'll work. Uh, fundamentally, that model really no longer applies. So now um, Al knows that I feel so strongly about the intersection of work and learning that uh, after putting myself through the pain of writing a book called America Needs Talent in 2015, I've now done it again uh, with this torture of a new book, uh, which is nearing completion and will be published next year, that looks specifically at this question, the future of human work, which is uh, what uh, I say simply is the work that only humans can do in this age of smart machines. So I think it's up to us to prepare people for this escalating, changing nature of work as we also transform education after high school so that it can be more affordable, more accessible, and more relevant to workforce needs. And you know, I think this challenge is going to become more difficult and, and important to address as things like AI and automation transform work even faster than we anticipated. Technology is transforming the skills we need and the speed of change. And, you know, I think you all know that Indiana is especially vulnerable to these changes. I often use the example of Subaru, one of our great Indiana employers. Subaru opened its Indiana plant in 1989. That year, Subaru produced 88 cars a day, and a human actually performed the weld on every single uh, vehicle uh, coming across that line. By 2016, the plant in Lafayette was producing 1,350 cars a day, a 15-fold increase, but the welding was performed entirely by robots. Today, with the help of AI, robots don't just weld, they also do quality control and other functions that were once performed by humans. So, you know, it's not just the manufacturing sector that's at risk. Uh, here at, at the Crossroads of America, truck drivers and transportation workers, we know the story uh, of the fear that driverless cars and trucks will put them out of jobs. Uh, we're, we're facing the terrible consequence of 3,000 Celadon drivers losing their jobs just this last week as the company declared bankruptcy. All of this has profound implications for us. How do we help adults upgrade their skills to stay competitive? How can we improve the way we learn at work and how we work while learning? Companies across the country are ratcheting up their support for incumbent workers to earn degrees. You've all heard of Walmart, of course. Uh, like me, maybe you've been there in the last few days. Uh, Walmart's Live Better You program launched in May of 2018 is supporting more than 12,000 employees to attend college for just a dollar a day, with plans to, to support more than 70,000 workers over the next several years. These are adults who are working while learning, able to complete a certification, a certificate, or a degree debt-free. Now, it's not widely known, but from our perspective, Walmart has done some incredibly smart things with this program. One of the most important is that they've intentionally connected it with their academies, which is the company's work-based uh, learning program that supports upskilling within the company. In other words, connecting the academies to live better you. Academy graduates earn between 14 and 21 credits toward credential programs at partner colleges. And we know that Walmart's investment in its own people is likely to pay off for the company as well as them as individuals. Lumina is actually conducting an early assessment of the ROI on that program early next year. So we hope you'll stay tuned for the, for the results on that. 
Now, on the second point of completion, um, you know, to prepare people for the human work that I talk about in the new book, we actually need to get more people into and through our higher ed institutions. And the biggest challenge in Indiana, to be sure, has been that part between when they enroll and when they actually graduate. Uh, I think you've shown great foresight to make completion a constant foundational goal throughout all of those strategic plans that you've issued over the course of, of more than a decade. You've done this while continuing to keep an eye on the attainment horizon. We can't get to our attainment goal without thousands more Hoosiers completing what they started. And I also agree that higher education's changing landscape demands a broader definition of completion, one that sees uh, education as, as you point out, relevant, lifelong, and measurable. Now, strategies like the 21st Century Scholars Program uh, obviously help. But as I mentioned, Indiana's got a long way to go. That 43% attainment rate for Indiana means that we are essentially in the bottom third of states. There's only 13 states that have lower attainment rates than Indiana. That leaves a lot of Hoosiers at risk. At least 750,000 Hoosier adults started college but never finished. Still others, of course, never even finished high school. But of those who do graduate high school in Indiana, only 63% actually go on to college. That's actually down a little bit from 65% two years ago and below the national average, which is now about 67%. So here's the question. From your vantage point, how do you begin to address these issues? This is the question Al has asked me several times in, in the course of the last year. Like Indiana, other states, we think, are starting to consider and rise to this challenge. We're seeing results from statewide focus strategies that enhance learner success by incentivizing institutions to deliver on what we call evidence-based strategies, holding institutions to higher standards, and removing what are often barriers to completion. These strategies range from everything from funding formulas to comprehensive financial aid and wraparound support programs to investing in curricular innovations that increase completion and partnering with communities and local actors, workforce, health, and human services, and justice system agencies. Now, uh, unlike those ads that you uh, sometimes see, you know, when you're online and uh, they say, there's one simple trick to do, you know, whatever, right? The fact is, there are no simple tricks. There's no magic bullet to solve this completion challenge. It takes everyone at the table pushing towards the state attainment goal. But we do know from research and experience that there are proven strategies for success. So let me mention just a few of the things that we think work. First, use financing policies as leverage to create the change that you want. Creating policies and financial structures at the state level that forces institutions to use evidence-based strategies to complete more students is effective. Indiana should look to increase the percentage of funding dedicated to student success. Now, you all know that currently the amount of funding that's at risk to institutions in the formula is a little below 10%. Um, even this relatively small amount I think has been successful in moving the completion needle in the right direction. But frankly, the pace of change has to accelerate. We know that change doesn't occur in public systems without aligning financing and policy <coughs> incentives. Driving more funding towards student success at the institutional level, again, especially uh, incentives for, for serving low-income students, for serving uh, students of color, for serving rural students, could help to bend the completion curve further and faster. Second, double down on data-driven student engagement strategies. Now, I know that sounds a little bit wonky, but maybe an easier way to say it is that the commission should support Indiana institutions to actually use the data that they have more effectively. Uh, at Georgia State University, the completion rate jumped 22 percentage points over a decade as the school used data analytics to help advisors identify students at risk of falling behind or dropping out, 22 percentage points. Advisors step in to help at crucial moments, like when students take exams, register, and choose majors. Student can also ask for micro grants to pay for essential things that often are the things that get in the way of completion, things like books, or clothing, or even tires in their car. Third, follow the facts when it comes to the well-known barriers that remediation presents to the learners in our higher ed institutions. You know, I think Indiana should celebrate the overdue and rightful demise of developmental ed 
with its increasing support of co-requisite remediation. We've seen some tremendous gains in other places, like at the California State University system, which offers intensive tutoring and support alongside these developmental education reforms. This has resulted, in the case of the CSU system, in a 700% increase in the number of students passing their first term math course. It also helped boost the school's six-year completion rate by five percentage points in five years, after many years of stagnancy. Uh, and for students starting out at, at a community college, uh, the California community colleges are using multiple measures, including high school coursework, grades, and grade point averages to place students into English and math, actually maximizing the probability that a student will enter and complete what is the transfer level of coursework. Fourth, um, I say this with uh, great respect uh, to our colleagues in Washington, don't leave the growing burdens that student debt impose on completion in the hands of the feds. Here, the state needs to continue to find ways to reconnect with learners. Uh, thanks to a unique debt forgiveness program, Wayne State University has the nation's fastest growing graduation rate, and more than tripled its graduation rate for black students. Uh, the way they did that is this. Rather than hold student transcripts hostage over small debts, Wayne State forgives debt when students re-enroll and then releases that debt upon a graduation. The program had a net financial gain of $200,000 in the first seven months. This program actually worked in Michigan because state policy didn't actually get in the way of Wayne State being able to do that. It might be possible for Indiana to consider a similar program at the state level. Fifth, use the leverage of both higher ed and workforce strategies together in solving this completion challenge. Now, through entities like the governor's workforce cabinet, which, of course, Commissioner Lovers is playing an important leadership role on, Indiana can identify and align a wide array of resources and apply them to talent development. Uh, North Carolina has recently dedicated federal workforce funds, WIOA funds, into a finish line grant program to provide quick release emergency resources to community college students at risk of, of dropping out due to those kinds of small life happens type of events like car trouble or emergency medical expenses. We may be able to emulate those kind of strategies here. And six, develop and implement completion strategies that aim to increase success rates for adults. You know, I think Indiana's been a leader in creating pathways for older working age uh, adults. Expand that effort with communications and innovation uh, curricula and financing. As the number of traditional age students is actually declining, it'll be critical to focus on the thousands of adults without credentials. This includes in providing in innovative financing for all institutions to create new curricular models that provide a faster timetable to completion. So for example, in Ohio, Sinclair Community College in Dayton has a competency-based education program that's so, that, that is so effective that students complete their credentials 35% faster and at a rate 15 percentage points higher than their counterparts in traditional programs. You know, beyond completion, I think there's still a lot more to do. And um, staying with that theme of serving adults uh, that I just talked about a moment ago, um, I think we need the state to develop more cohesive, effective strategies to expand access to quality credentials and certificates to help, uh, help adults learn, earn, and serve uh, uh, their communities and therefore improve their lives. Lumen is working hard on this because states are asking for help, and we think the opportunity is huge. For the one in five Americans between the ages of 25 and 64 with no post-secondary education experience at all, certifications and non-degree credentials may be their best chance to get onto that ladder of success. Now, we define quality credentials as degrees, industry certifications, apprentice certificates, and licenses that result in valuable skills that lead to good jobs and further learning. And we view credentials in an inclusive way. In other words, both degree and non-degree pathways. Degrees are a credential. We should stop referring to degrees and credentials. These are all part of the same, same universe. For credentials to work, we need a highly flexible system, one where quality learning counts everywhere it happens, at work, in the military, in union halls, libraries, and more. In this new ecosystem of learning and working, 
We need to measure skills not by the credit hour, but on proven competencies. In other words, on what we know and can do. Now, of course, Indiana is making very good strides in this arena. Uh, you all know that in January, in the state of the state of the address, Governor Holcomb said Indiana's post high school credential attainment rate grew from 2016-17 and nearly doubled the national average and, e and even faster among Hoosiers 25 to 44 years old. And last year, 9,000 uh, Hoosiers enrolled in workforce ready certificate programs, with these grants increasing again this year to help people earn certificates in high demand industries. You know, most adult learners have started their post-secondary learning journey outside of the higher ed system. They're learning in the military, through employer-provided training, with eligible training providers, and even in the criminal justice system. What they need is an automatic on-ramp from these learning experiences into higher education. Rather than make adults retrain and start over up in the freshman year, we should automatically recognize their learning towards post-secondary credentials. Now, I think this goes beyond simply letting institutions know they can offer these assessments of prior learning. That's obviously important. Uh, ensuring that recognition of learning is automatic and not requiring that people be reassessed, uh, be reassessed actually works. For instance, the U.S. Department of Transportation allows veterans with two years of experience operating heavy military vehicles to obtain a CDL, a commercial driver's license, without taking the driving test. So far, more than 26,000 veterans have benefited from that program nationally. Florida also has established policy that sets the standard for how industry certifications will be accepted for credit at public colleges and universities. Now, Lumina's focus on trying to bring transparency to this vast credential marketplace by developing a series of new tools and infrastructure that create essentially what is a common language and help ensure that credentials are high quality and easily recognized. You've been a leader when it comes to implementation of credential transparency via the credential engine platforms, which we applaud, but a lot more needs to still be done. And important to this transparency work, I think, is to make sure that both quality and equity are part of the same conversation when it comes to credentials. Now, um, Al's familiar with this. Lumina convened a national task force uh, earlier this year to look at these issues. And their overwhelming conclusion is that you can't have one without the other. In other words, as the task force said, without improved quality, there can be no meaningful equity. And without improved equity, claims for quality ring hollow. So we'd urge you to drive this point forward in everything you do when, to, when, this, when it comes to this important adult attainment work. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to conclude uh, and in a moment take your questions and comments by talking a little bit more candidly about this last point that I was making, this point about equity. You know, the promise of American opportunity has always been in sharp contrast with our, our nation's legacy of racial discrimination and oppression. We're painfully aware that unfair inequities persist, mostly for people of color and low-income individuals. The Lumina Foundation, equity is at the heart of our mission and I'd like to encourage you to make it yours also. A lack of access to high quality learning opportunities after high school, complemented by real academic, financial, and social supports, has denied black, Hispanic, and Native American people opportunities to advance economically and secure good jobs in our country. Your 2019 equity report showed that we're making good progress in closing the access gap for different student populations especially those 21st century scholars. The majority of each racial and ethnic group enrolled in college, but did so at different rates. So for example, over three quarters, 79% of Asian students enrolled in college within one year of high school, compared to 65% of white, 57% 50 of black, and 53% of Hispanic students. For all of the gains that you point out uh, in the report and more, we want to applaud you but significant access success and completion gaps remain. For instance, black Hoosiers overall, college enrollment has steadily decreased over the last five years, negative 8%, uh, the highest drop of any subgroup. And Hispanic college going is essentially at the same level, 53%, that it was back in 2012. These are trends that quite simply have to be reversed. In Indiana, only 19% of Hispanics and 28% of African-American students 
have obtained a degree or credential compared to 38% of white students and 62% of Asian American students. Roughly two thirds of Asian, white, and other students complete a college credential within six, six years, compared to only 57% of Hispanic students and 35% of black students. Now, from a distance, I think Indiana has come a long way in the past 20 years. Consistent leadership from local and state leaders has helped to create and implement policy and programs to improve the economy and education from early childhood to career and family. Lumen has been part of this journey, advocating, supporting, and cajoling these efforts wherever we think they're needed. Indiana has been an early innovator in key policy areas that started here and spread across the nation. Examples of this include the 21st Century Scholars Program, which we should be rightly proud of, the state's performance or outcomes-based funding formula, broad and deep data collection from early childhood to the workforce, competency-based programs like WGU, reconnecting with adults who have some, some college but no credentials, the, the You Can Go Back uh, initiative, comprehensive need-based financial aid, transparent credentialing work, credential engine, and dual enrollment, uh, concurrent enrollment opportunities. The point is, Indiana has put its money into its policy and we should all be rightfully proud of these efforts. You've uh, implemented or supported almost everything Lumina has seen across the country as evidence-based practices that lead to higher education attainment and to increased completion. And yet, you wouldn't be wrong if you are, like I am, frustrated by the relative, relatively anemic growth in completion and attainment, especially for our equity population. I think the answer is that all these past efforts are vital. Vital, but insufficient for creating a talent development ecosystem that works for all learners from all backgrounds and experiences. I believe the Commission's College Equity Report does important work to shine a light on gaps for at-risk populations, particularly students of color. The dilemma for this Commission is that a report, no matter how well-crafted, doesn't change policy or programs practices, or budgets. You do. And I'd like to encourage you to embrace a change in thinking that we're seeing across the country. Several states are taking a leadership role in making concerted efforts to, enact, to attack inequity in policy, budgets, and practice. We've partnered now with Tennessee, Colorado, Oregon, and Virginia to focus resources and policy squarely towards better serving students of color. These states have agreed to increase attainment for equity populations by at least 5% over the next five years. These states have realized that intentionally designed policies and actions created systems that do not serve students of color and low-income students well. These states realize that it will take concerted, deliberate policy action to achieve racial equity. At Lumina, we believe achieving fair and just outcomes for people of color has to be the mission of higher education. So if you believe, like me, that education and learning is human emancipation, we must not continue to build policies and programs that don't result in equitable access and success for those students of color and low-income students. Data and information contained in your equity report, I think, ably raises the issue, but frankly, now comes the hard part. Let's work together to build policies with equity as the core value. Our team has spent the last three months Scott and his team, let's be clear, speaking with Indiana government, higher education, business, philanthropy, advocacy organizations, and local leaders, gathering feedback from the field on Indiana's commitment to developing a talent development system with equity at its core. What we heard reinforces what we know, that Lumina and the Commission are seen as leaders for equity and excellence in education. That's nice, but we need a broader, deeper coalition. Indiana has equity champions, but they're isolated, lacking a comprehensive coalition of actors and leaders who are committed to racial justice and equity. Too frequently, we heard a raising all boats refrain, or heard that income or culture is to blame for disparities and in outcomes, instead of policy and practice that have created those outcomes. Indiana, across our government, our institution, our systems, and our communities, needs a deeper level of awareness and commitment to actually improve outcomes for black, Hispanic, and Native American Hoosiers, supporting our state to achieve its fullest potential. If there's a more urgent priority than this, I just can't imagine what it is. Supporting the populations we've poorly served in the past 
to gain higher education is the key not only to our 60% goal, but really to the future of our state and to our country. So you know, I am really going to end now. At the end of the day, we're all on the front lines of expanding economic opportunity for Hoosiers. Your plan, uh, I think, is wonderfully, amazingly, ridiculously aspirational. Good for you. Your blueprint to reach higher in a state of change is relevant and timely. But this is not just about a 60% goal or about better paying jobs. Learning is essential to our personal well-being and the strength of our democracy. It opens doors to opportunity. It makes us more informed, more curious. It gives us the confidence to contribute and to lead. It strengthens our families. Most of all, it enriches our lives, our internal lives, driving curiosity, self-improvement, and fueling ambition, and our lives as communities, how we live with each other, how we care for and respect each other. So let's join forces as you implement your plan. Let's partner to craft and implement proven state policy and institutional practice that incentivizes institutions towards completion, aligns funding and policy to support meeting urgent workforce needs, develops Hoosier talent, and closes unfair equity gaps. The time to lead is now in this place we all call our Indiana home. Thank you. Excellent. So, uh, can I ask you to share that with us? Can we send it around? Absolutely. Sorry for the canned nature of the remarks, but we wanted to get it all down and make sure that you, uh, you, you heard the complete package here. Well, especially those six recommendations, I think, that would be important for us. I, I agree. So, Chris, I've got a couple of questions, if you don't mind, Jamie. Thank you very well done, and, and lots of good. Uh, good advice and good direction. But let me take the first two of your six, as I understood them. Um, we, as you know, struggled when we first started uh, um, moving forward on, on uh, outcomes-based uh, funding. Uh, and we been sort of at the edge of the numbers, and, and it's been hard every year to kind of push further. You are encouraging us to be more aggressive uh, in that regard. Uh, and you said, evidence-based funding uh, mm -hmm. in terms of the completion uh, goal in particular. Can you elaborate on that one a little bit? Before you do that, also, you mentioned, mentioned double down on data-based engagement strategies. You expand that a little bit in terms of where we find it, how we find it, what are the data-based engagement strategies? Now let me ask Scott to take the second one. I'll talk a little bit about the, the outcome-based funding because I've, so I've been on this uh, uh, almost 30-year journey around performance and outcome-based funding, uh, going back to my days well before before Lumina. Uh, you would think, after 30 years of experience, including outside the country, by the way, I worked on outcomes-based funding in in, in uh, South Africa and other parts of the world. That you'd think we'd get this right. This is really hard. It's complicated, and to your point, it's hard to know what the right levers are. It's sort of it's not old school, but it's it's sort of like an old soundboard, and we kind of turn the dials to get the right mix. That's part of the issue that I think you, you've got to think through here. But what, I, what I'm trying to encourage you to do here is to say, don't focus just on that 10%, that sort of magic threshold. You've got to sort of keep increasing that, but you've got to focus more on what the right levers are so that you can actually achieve the outcomes within which that rising percentage of, of resources that you have put at risk, essentially, through the outcomes-based model to make sure that you're achieving the maximum outcomes that, that you want to achieve. You've shown that it works, but you've got to keep doing more and more of that. If, if you're successful at what you're doing, you've got to build on the success and do even do even more of that. It seems to me that the challenge for the institution, which I understand, is that the higher you get into the percentage points, the more it impacts the sort of base or core operation of what they're doing. But frankly, that's the point. The point here is you're trying to fundamentally change the core operation so that they're actually focused on those outcomes, on those shared outcomes that matter to the state. And there is no, again, no magic bullet, no simple formula, no one state that you should look to for information, but we've got to constantly be churning the wheel and mining the data from what we're learning from other places as well as our own state to continue to ratchet up that percent 
and also to make sure that that mix of what you're doing uh, continues to achieve the outcomes that you want to achieve. I'll let Scott talk about the, the data-driven piece. Thanks, Jamie. Great question. Um, one quick note on the outcomes-based funding, the financing side of it, is, is one way to think of this, um, and this comes from a background as a K-12 funding formula walk, is that, that instead of providing a per student FTE mix, that you actually provide incentive resources to support students that are more complex to, <coughs> to educate, that we know are, are not as successful typically, and providing resources for the institution to serve those students, which drives the money to the institutions that are serving those students. And so similarly, in like K-12 education, we wouldn't, we wouldn't expect an institution to serve um, to, to, you, you look at Title I funding that, that comes from federal government, you look at English language, language um, IDEA dollars, those are all on top of what that FTE basis is. So thinking about it in a way, of what are the resources that are needed to support that type of student? Um, on the data-driven data side, what this requires in a lot of cases is for the, 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 the data people, especially at the commission, to work with your institutional leaders, um, to then also work with faculty. Uh, around this because part of the dilemma that we have in a lot of states is that the data that is generated to support these type of intrusive advising types of things is rather limited because you don't have a lot of just-in-time um, academic information. So, you know, in a typical class when you're offered, say, say two, you know, two, um, a midterm and a final exam and maybe a paper, the student doesn't know that they've fallen off their fallen off until they're, they're seven weeks into the semester. And so you've got to really work with your faculty to start to generate a much more robust data set around students so that you can actually start to trigger um, interventions. And I think a lot of the work that Purdue has done, it gets into that conversation where they're, where they're doing that work. But the, the conversation here is how can, the, how can the coordinating board, how can the state support that type of activity? In a lot of cases, what it is is looking at it from a policy lens of the student. What does the student need to know and be able to do to be successful? And how, how much data can we put in their hands so that they can be rely, they can, they can rely on that and make good decisions about, about what they're doing? But we can definitely share with the commission staff several states that have done this at a policy level and then institutions that are making changes. Dan. Yeah, thank you. And thank you both for being here. Great, fantastic uh, Thanks, yeah. presentation and messages for us to think deeply about. So um, just kind of a follow-up on what's been talked about both in your comments and then the question from Chris. So I spent a lot of my time over the years in two worlds that have a lot of commonalities, healthcare, medicine, and education and workforce, and two big, multivariable, complex systems that have a lot of moving parts that are hard to change. So <clears throat> two things that I've noticed that are, there's a lot of commonalities, but two that are really jump out at me over, over the years have, uh, that apply to both. One, the, the only thing that I consistently see that changes behavior is what I would call intrusive type of advising, intrusive types of customized action around getting the behavior to, to change. So you talked about the data-driven solutions and, and that sort of thing. So number one, that applies to both. Number two, where policy comes in, it, it often turns, not just in Indiana, but well-intended policy often ends up, unfortunately, being implemented in a way that it is the most expensive and most challenging for a user, a consumer, if you will, the, the, the right choice for them is often the most expensive and the hardest to make. And we don't think enough about that when we craft final policy and how those things get implemented. So those two things, to me, whether I may be just skewed or not, come, come into mind around both institutions. Yeah. Number one, do you agree with some of that? Number two, do we need to spend more time thinking about and putting resources towards those types of um, activities, if you will, in addition to everything else we're doing. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree on, on both. And I would say, in particular, the intrusive advising part, again, it's an evidence-based approach. It works. We've got evidence from institutions, from states, to show that, that this is the case. And you know, for those of you who don't uh, fully grasp this, it's some combination of direct sort of human intervention and the increasing use of technology, where you can actually use technology
technology, particularly to, to provide the sort of behavioral nudges. There's a whole sort of industry now of behavioral nudging out there to change people, people's behavior. You know, half the people in my, in my universe are using Noom to sort of lose weight. Uh, you know, this this uh, app that bugs you about your lifestyle choices. And it's very similar to what this intrusive advising strategy and behavioral nudging is all about. It is, hey, you missed class. Hey, did you finish that assignment? Hey, did you, uh, you know, what are you doing? Are you getting enough sleep? Like, there's all kinds of things that this intrusive advising does. Um, again, both in person as well as using, using the increasingly um, uh, targeted technology means in order to make, make, that, uh, make that successful. When you and I were, were college age, uh, the advising took place maybe once or twice a year uh, in a very controlled circumstance. We now have capacity to do advising real time and to do so in a way that is very targeted to the interests and the needs and the life, life circumstances of, of those students. And I think you're right. There's a sort of cost efficiency. You can't replace some of the human interactions. So I don't want to uh, pretend here that you can do all of this with technology. But technology is a huge boost to this, and I think that there's probably more that we can do in terms of comprehensive uh, policy strategies than we've pursued um, in, uh, up until this point. Do you, do you encourage funding that specifically? I mean, we, if I go back 10 years, 12 years, we had conferences where we talked about what do we do to be more effective in advising. And actually Purdue and I believe one other school talked about what they were doing to intervene in people, they were immediately knowing when somebody went showing up to class and somebody would be assigned to make the call to the person, where are you, there was follow up. And it was more effective to have the professor himself follow up to show that he cared about it and knew that the person wasn't there so they felt more connected. And then we kept putting those things out there and then we put money for getting people to be complete. Yeah. Are we too oblique between the two? Do we need a time to gather further? Yeah, and may, maybe, and I would encourage you to use sort of targeted grant funding to do one thing, but hey, maybe this is an example of where you can use outcomes-based funding to change the behavior of institutions. How are they doing it? What, you know, are, are, they, are they following the proven strategies? What success are they having with it? I mean, there, there are things that you can do within existing funding mechanisms and create new funding mechanisms in order to do that. So don't think of this as just sort of a bolt-on and add-on to existing things. Think of this as core to increasing completion and student success, and find ways to get it into the into the water supply, get it into the DNA of what they do as institutions. Not as a nice to have, but as a got to have. First of all, um, Jamie Scott, I applaud um, you know your wife's mission and the importance of it, and Lumen is such an asset to Indiana and and nationally, um, and. We're in, uh, my sense is that we're in this either massive renovation, um, if you think the house, of our education system, if not a complete rebuild. And one of the things that um, I agree with, by the way, agree with everything that you guys have said. Uh, one of the things that continues to bother me, and my colleagues on the commission know this because they, because they bring it up, I don't have the answer. But one of the things that really bothers me is that uh, in our effort, in our zeal to, uh, to lift as many people into higher education, whether it's certificates or you know, all the way through uh, degrees, um, I, I'm, I'm really bothered by um, the word quality, which is bandied about. But there has been no constructive real analysis of what does quality mean in higher education. And I think of it in terms of today, an effort to broaden the ability to touch the higher education system. You can now take uh, uh, courses for credit in high school. You can do online courses. Uh, you can take courses in, on regional campuses. You can take courses you know, on, on our research university campuses. Um, but is there a moral responsibility for to assure that uh, people who are paying for a college credit are getting similar quality wherever they touch the entry to our higher education system. And I don't know, because there's very little data out there, but anecdotally, I'm disquieted by what I think is real disparities in the quality of education across our higher, our higher 
higher education system. And the inability or, or the lack of research around how do we measure quality? How, how, how do we actually measure quality in a way that allows institutions to truly determine the quality of their outputs uh, for, for those that are using the higher education system to be able to make thoughtful decisions around where they want to pursue their higher education uh, goals based on quality data. Um, and and there, we all talk about quality, but there's been precious little real effort around trying to define what is quality yeah. and how do we measure it and, and how is it used. My last point is there's a number of studies out there that show uh, the United States higher education system compared to other countries around the world has actually been declining. Um, uh, I'm not sure all of the data that's being pulled in and how it's being measured, but clearly the higher education system in the US has either declined or other countries have dramatically increased, but, but we're, not, uh, we're not in the top five of the world anymore. And so all of those things kind of jumble around in my mind as we strive to position our country uh, Jamie, your point, you know, for the, for the next 100 years, are we going to be, continue to be a leader? Um, how, how do we not have a meaningful conversation around quality and how to measure it uh, and, and how to uh, articulate it? Yeah, yeah just quick, uh, quick underscoring of a couple of things you, you said here, Chris, that are, I just want to highlight. You know, one is quality has been the elusive part of the equation for, for a very long time. I would argue that we do have a better understanding of quality than we did a decade or two ago. There's been a lot of work on this. And with apologies for the self-reference here, this task force that I mentioned in my prepared comments that Lumina organized uh, issued a report. Again, we know, we know how good reports are. But issued a report called Unla Unlocking the Nation's Potential, which is about this issue of quality and how you think about uh, quality and, and, and equity in, in parallel ways. But the important thing about that task force was that it was a different kind of thing than what we've done before because it began with the predicate that Lumina offered actually back in our first strategic plan in 2008, 2009, which was we argued, so Lumina's goal has always been that we want 60% of Americans to have a high quality degree, certificate, or other, or, or other credentials by 2025. And the question that we asked ourselves was, what do we mean when we say high quality? And so in that strategic plan back in 2008, we defined quality in a footnote, literally. And the footnote said, quality is defined as having well-defined and transparent learning outcomes that lead to further education and employment. So this idea here that you've got to be able to demonstrate both, that in fact there's not quality if you can just get a, move up the, the chain of, of learning and not get a job, not get employed. And there's not quality if it just shows that there's an employment outcome, but you actually haven't advanced yourself in other ways uh, to, to make, you, make you successful. That was the foundation. What this group said in, in their report, and this report was written, importantly, not by the sort of traditional constituency of the people from four-year institutions. It was written by people who come from community colleges, from non-higher ed contexts, workforce-based um, entities, from the, from the corporate sector, from the accreditors, from, from lots of different uh, vantage points, that in fact, we have to underscore this issue, this shared understanding of what quality is in ways that work, not just for higher ed, but work for the rest of the world. Uh, we've talked past each other for too much of that of that time period. So I really encourage you to look at this because what they do is lay out a way in which we should be having this sort of shared conversation between the real world and higher education that I think is different than, than what we than what we've seen before. Um, I, I was going to address your other point. I forget what your other point was. Your second point. Uh, well, it just I mean it, it really is just this whole you know you as we're putting pressure on universities to move students to completion. Yeah. Uh, how are we just doing the measurement of quality? And then how do we use that measurement of quality to determine, for instance, we could have, Indiana could have, in fact, one of the best public-private higher education systems in the country, but we don't know that. And, and so how do, we, how, how do we attract talent, much less keep our talent, with, uh, with, without some mechanism around measuring quality? No, I think 
think you are on the path, frankly, and I think the commission deserves credit here for trying to lead on, on that issue. Um, the quality measurement is an ongoing iterative thing. 